and welcome to the Political Orphanage, a home for plucky misfits and problem solvers. I'm your host, Andrew Heaton, and I fly out shortly to Milwaukee to cover the National Republican Convention this week, which I thought the big news at would be whoever Trump picks as his running mate. Will it be Doug Burgum? J.D. Vance? Roseanne Barr? Maybe a Trump impersonator, which would be pretty funny. That's not completely outside of the realm of possibilities. I'm not saying it would be a good electoral pick, but it it would be funny if Trump picked a impersonator of himself as his running mate. We gotta we gotta see the humor in that. But no, it turns out we've all been holding out for the Veep stakes, and they will now be eclipsed by what happened this weekend and what happens when Trump talks about it. In fact, there's a very good chance that the headline speech Donald Trump will be giving at the convention will be the most watched campaign speech in American history. Not just an acceptance speech for the Republican nomination for president, but an address following a very serious, very near-miss assassination attempt. Now here shortly, I will tell you what I hope to hear from that speech when I am in Milwaukee. But before we get there, I feel like we should at least touch on the assassination attempt, which occurred over the weekend. I'm going to gloss over the obvious stuff because it has been said rightly by many people, and you already know it. Political violence is horrible. In the United States, we eliminate candidates through the democratic process, ideally through fun sex scandals, but not through murder. And it is genuinely sad that an innocent father was killed and that two people are in critical condition, perhaps irreparably altered. Not to mention that the parents of the shooter just lost a son, and we don't know what their circumstances are, but they're probably pretty horrible right now. And of course, it's just a sad day for the country. It's a sad state that we've come to, not to mention... A tad frightening. I kind of get the impression that we are in a political cycle now, not unlike the 1960s, which had its own assassinations and armed political groups, and potentially for us, even the return of bell-bottom jeans. So anyway, Saturday, I went to go hang out with my friend Brian Brushwood, and we watched Fargo Season 5, which is a side note. Fargo is excellent narrative storytelling, and it's brilliant to set the whole murderscape in Minnesota because the accents are so funny and disarming. There's nothing funnier than a Minnesotan with a thick accent committing murder. It just, it, it, you wouldn't think it would ever happen. Whenever I watch things set in Minnesota, I think this state could absolutely be its own country in terms of culture, and it would be really cute and difficult to take seriously. It would be like this little, Norway inside of the United States. Like, I can't picture a Minnesotan general like giving a really good tub thumping speech about invading Canada. There will never be a James Bond villain who hails from St. Paul. Anyway, about halfway through episode two of Fargo, I wanted to look up one of the actors, the smug cop kid, if you've seen it. I was thinking, I think that's the kid from Stranger Things. I'm pretty sure he was in Stranger Things. So I picked up my phone only to receive word from Justin Robert Young that Donald Trump had been wounded in an assassination attempt, prompting Brian Brushwood and I to pause the show and scrutinize that footage and the air fist image, the the air pumping fist image that will become, I think, about as iconic as the flag over Iwo Jima at least for the Trump campaign, if not for history. And then Brian and I very logically did what I assume you did, which was just obsessively doom scroll on Twitter to try to find out what happened. Who who did this? Who who sang what about what? We did that for about half an hour, and then we went, well, the situation doesn't seem to be evolving that quickly at this point. We really should go back to watching Fargo season five, it's it's quite bingeable. But in between episodes, 
We watched four episodes in one one day, but in between the episodes, Brian and I would take a break to doom scroll and banter and see what the Internet's collective subconscious was spewing out about this sorry event. And there were a lot of very bad takes that were coming forth in the wake of this assassination. So we're going to work our way to what I hope happens at the convention, what I hope Trump says. But in the meantime, let's work our way up through these bad takes. We're going to start tiny and get to the big stuff. Political violence, things like that. All right, kick off. Conspiracy theories. Whoo, whoo boy. Oh, this is a field day for conspiracy theorists. I'm not going to attempt to chart the various conspiracy theories that are percolating right now, although... The one that I am most astonished by came from a well-connected operative in the Democratic fundraising sector who sent out an email to journalists asking, isn't it possible that Trump and Putin staged this? Not just Trump, by the way, but Trump and Putin. And the answer to that question is, are you insane? We've all seen the footage, right? Everybody's seen the footage. So... Let's assume for a moment that Trump did, in fact, arrange a fake assassination attempt, that at some point over the last month he went, you know, I just throttled the cadaver of Joe Biden in a televised debate. I'm the front runner. I don't even really need a vice president at this point in terms of getting elected. I think I'll hire a 20-year-old virgin from Bethel Park, Pennsylvania to almost kill me to get some media attention which is something difficult for me to obtain media attention. So I will, yeah, I'll hire that virgin. And also, let's just further assume that he didn't remotely care about collateral damage, that he was okay with unrelated civilians getting shot, that that's the level of derangement he had. And he was also confident that he could pull off this entire thing without anybody blabbing. Okay. Even in this rather fanciful scenario which at least in the email I read involved Putin, nobody, nobody is going to stage a photo op like that, however advantageous, however iconic, if it necessitates playing William Tell within two inches of accuracy or otherwise your head explodes like a pumpkin. Not, just not, even if we accept self-directed evil as a premise to this theory, the self interest would end up tipping it over. Christopher Hitchens opined that what can be asserted without evidence can also be dismissed without evidence. That was any any conspiracy theory floating around this is probably making an extraordinary claim and they require extraordinary evidence to back up to get you to get you to that point. If there's no evidence you can dismiss them and I Hereby invoke the glowing force ghost of Christopher Hitchens and wholesale dismiss that particular conspiracy theory. I, The folks peddling that, who I assume by now, I have not been on Twitter the last that much the last couple of days, but I assume the people that were peddling that have backed off and deleted their breathless tweets because if you're at the point where you think that Putin and Trump staged their own personal Reichstag fire to that that's a level of derangement that should make you take stock of your positions. That's a level of, you could not like Trump. I don't like Trump, but getting to that point is really far on the spectrum of, of derangement. The other conspiracy theory, let's go the other direction for a minute. The other conspiracy theory I'm seeing is this, that the secret service purposefully allowed this to happen because either the secret service is the deep state and they want Donald Trump to be taken out, or alternately, Joe Biden shuffled the cards in such a way to allow this to happen, that Joe Biden purposefully did not give them sufficient uh, sufficient security details because he wanted to neutralize Trump through death. And here, I'm not going to invoke Christopher Hitchens. I'm going to invoke Hanlon, as in Hanlon's razor. This is kind of like Occam's razor. You know Occam's razor. A when in doubt, The simplest solution is probably the correct one. Hanlon's razor goes like this. Do not attribute to malice that which you can attribute to laziness or incompetency. So it is far, far more likely, based on my minimal understanding here, 
that the Secret Service screwed up than that a division manager noticed a gunman and decided to sit on his hands and hope that they killed the Republican frontrunner. That that was the goal was to have that happen, but have it happen split second enough that the Secret Service wouldn't get in too much trouble or something like that. I've I've not scrutinized this yet. I think Hanlon's razor is the good default position unless extraordinary evidence comes to the fore. It is better to assume screw ups and incompetency than Machiavellian Legion of Doom conspiracy theories. Now, the reaction of the Secret Service, the role and failures of the Secret Service, that is going to be scrutinized extensively over the next few days. And rightly so. Very good thing that we're all going to be looking at it. I would recommend that the Secret Service maybe have a couple meetings regarding the assassination attempt, consider what went wrong, maybe fire somebody, or at very least put them on, I don't know, Jimmy Carter's detail for a few weeks, kind of punish them that way. It's my understanding that the Trump campaign has been asking for more security and that they were denied that, and it turns out they were right. But in terms of mental best practices, when there's ambiguity over a screw-up, I am inclined to de- to default on incompetency rather than going to conspiracy theories. And if we, in fact, believe that this heinous event was caused by people irresponsibly describing Trump as a Hitlerian character that would bring America to the precipice of fascism and someone shot at them. And we'll get into that stuff in a minute. But if if we are on that logic train, then it is a good idea at this time to not accuse President Biden of having tried to intentionally murder his political opponent, unless there is really outstanding evidence to think about that. Now, let's move on to the next dumb hot take that I saw bubbling up through the internet like an overbacked septic tank. The morning after Donald Trump was shot, he was seen driving a golf cart on a golf course, presumably his golf course. And weirdly, everybody had the same interpretation. Or everybody had the same f- setup and very different conclusions. So conservative commentators saw this picture of Trump on a golf cart and went, what a badass. The dude just got shot at. He missed death by a quarter of an inch, and he's still up the following day in time for the tee off. Whereas his detractors said, one of Trump's supporters is dead and two are in the hospital, and he's out golfing? He's golfing? How calloused. Okay, so. At this point in my life, nobody's ever taken a shot at me. I don't think so. I'm pretty sure. I'm fairly confident nobody's ever tried to assassinate me. But if I ever narrowly avoid an assassination attempt in some weird scenario where I'm important enough to anyone on the planet to try and whack me. If I ever get to that point, how I would process the trauma of that is very much up in the air. Maybe I would try to numb myself and tune out my brain by playing Age of Empires 2 for six hours. Maybe I would drink a bottle of whiskey. Perhaps I would steal some of my dog Wallace's Trazodone and watch Fargo season five all over again to be caught up in the fast-paced, bingeable storytelling of Noah Hawley. So Trump playing golf, and this is also assuming he was actually playing golf, by the way. I just, I saw some of these online and everybody else was reacting. I don't know that anybody fact-checked this, but let's assume he was in fact playing golf. That could mean a lot of different things. If Trump wanted to process what happened to him by walking around outside on a golf course, trying to whack a ball into a hole with a friend, Gang, let's not, I don't think we need to attribute callousness to this particular thing. Let's, let's, let's give him that he made tea time. How about, you know, for all the negative things I have said about Trump, if he showed up to tea time the day after somebody took a whack at him, that is impressive, not callousness. Let's move on. I would say somewhere between episode three and episode five of Fargo season five, When I was doom scrolling, I noticed a lot of social media posts screen grabbing headlines from legacy media like the New York Times with headlines that read something like Secret Service escorts Trump off stage after fall or other similar descriptions which seem to downplay the assassination attempt. These were interpreted as 
absurd reductions foisted by a hyper-partisan media which could not even give Trump credit for being shot at. And that was not my read at all. I These are still kind of percolating, which surprises me even now. I am unbothered by those. Yes, we all saw the footage on Twitter or television in what is now the most watched assassination attempt in global history. We all saw it. But I understand the Washington Post or the New York Times wanting to make absolutely sure nothing they reported was something that had been taken out of context or misinterpreted or misreported. In a high-pressure, high-stakes situation like a political assassination, it's good for official news outlets to only report that which they confirm rather than tossing out probable assumptions that might be incorrect. So, for example, if I had been spewing out my hot takes on Twitter, I don't think I tweeted anything that day because I don't view myself as a unpaid one-man news team that lives on Twitter. But anyway, had I done it, I would have said that Trump was grazed by two bullets because I could see the photo of him and you can see the blood on his ear and you can see two red lines across his face. But it turns out that that was he wasn't grazed by two bullets. A bullet got him in the ear and a bullet hit the teleprompter and shards of glass grazed his face. So if I had been reporting Trump got grazed by two bullets, I would not have been fully accurate. So at the same time, I understand somebody at CNN going, holy shit, this, oh my God, this is really big. Wait, hold on now, hold on. We need to make sure that we're dutifully reporting this very accurately. We want to make sure that we're not freaking out the entire country that is on the verge of a fucking bar fight every goddamn moment for the last four years by saying there's an assassination attempt if it turns out it's some idiot with a paintball gun or somebody set off some firecrackers as a prank. Let's hold back until we know it was, in fact, an assassination attempt. I think that's a good thing. I am unbothered by that. I have lots of nasty things to say about the media. Yes, I think it's tilted. I do not think it's objective or neutral. I think it, it pulls punches. Yes, 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 yes. This is not, this is a dumb thing, guys, to be worked up about. It makes you look dumb. Stop doing that. Back in 2019, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez got enraged at the New York Times for something similar. There was a headline that read, Coast Guard Lieutenant held an alleged, uh, alleged terrorist plot. And she took umbrage with the word alleged, which she saw as cowardice on behalf of the New York Times. The New York Times was both sidesing it. They were weasel wording it so that they didn't have to say what it was, which was a terrorist plot. They were giving it wiggle room, but it was very clearly a racist conspiracy plot. But in reality, it is standard operating procedure for newspapers to put the word alleged before a crime until the person has actually been convicted for very good reason. If the Andrew Heaton Daily says uh, Alan Smithberg, name I'm making up, uh, committed murder, and then it ruins his life, and it turns out later, nah, he, he didn't actually do that. It was somebody else. You cause a lot of collateral damage just to try to get something out. So leaning on the side of discretion rather than sensationalism is not something to be mocked with the media. And in particular, in a high-profile situation like this, I'm not the slightest bit bothered by it. Do we all agree the temperature's gone up with having a presidential candidate nearly shot in front of our eyes on 4K television? Yeah? Okay. Then accidentally saying that happening when it didn't happen would be a very bad move. So the relevant question to me, the real relevant question, if we want to rag on the media, is not, did the press try to frame this in a way that downplays Trump's badassery? The relevant question is, if the situation were reversed and a gunman had nearly killed Democratic candidate Joe Biden on Saturday, how would the exact same outlets be reacting? How would the commentariat be reacting? Would they have said, political violence is terrible, we are praying for the president and his family and the innocent civilian killed, and we should all acknowledge that Donald Trump and Joe Biden have strong competing arguments, but that's all part of a healthy democracy, and we all need to take a deep breath and lower the temperature in the room. My gut tells me no. My gut tells me no. I think that 
pundits would be freaking out so hard it would have altered the flight path of migratory birds. We would have seen a tremendous amount of content revolving around conservatism is inherently violent, fascism is forever percolating just below the surface, and of course, anybody who votes Republican is tacitly approving political violence. This is Trump's America. He is directly responsible for this through his unhinged rhetoric and so on and so forth. I have a very hard time thinking that that would not have been the reaction had the situation been reversed. Which brings us, I think, to the trickiest topic following the assassination attempt, which is, is hyperbolic rhetoric morally culpable for political violence? Conservatives like J.D. Vance, who might very well be the vice presidential nominee here in Later today, I'm recording. I don't think this will be up by the time the announcement is made, but he might be the VP candidate by the time this comes up. If not, up-and-coming Republican senator from Ohio, J.D. Vance said, this is the natural, this assassination attempt, is the natural predictable consequence of repeatedly saying that Trump is a literal fascist, would-be dictator, in cahoots with Putin, existential threat to the Republic for the last four years. If you say he is a dictator-in-waiting, who will never leave office, and is an American Hitler, then this is the natural consequence to this. Joy Reid, as little as two weeks ago, said letting Trump into the White House is letting Hitler into the White House. It would be better to vote for Biden in a coma than to put Hitler in the White House. So, according to Vance and a large group of conservatives, it is not surprising that somebody would actually believe this hype and say, well, if this is Adolf Trump that we're talking about, He is an existential threat to the Republic. And by the way, existential threat means the existence of the Republic is threatened. And I am a patriot and a hero for trying to take him out before he converts the Galactic Republic into the first Galactic Empire. Republican Mike Collins of Georgia, he's a a congressman uh, from Georgia, wrote, The Republican district attorney in Butler County, Pennsylvania, should immediately file charges against Joseph R. Biden for inciting an assassination. And we could also point to recent tweets from Joe Biden saying that America wants a president, not a dictator, to fall into such an indictment. J.D. Vance and the conservatives that are saying this have a point, or more specifically, I do think you can, I don't think you can simultaneously claim that Trump is an existential threat to American democracy, who will extinguish our republic and erect a fascist authoritarian state suspend voting rights, refuse to leave office, become an American Hitler, and at the same time say you are glad he survived the assassination attempt and you hope he's getting better and you're praying for him and his family. That, yes, that is, I, I think, a fairly contradictory worldview, unless you were truly, truly a ultra pacifist who would not have wanted to shoot Hitler had you had the chance back in the 40s. But for most people, though, I think that those are contradictory positions. It's kind of like if you really think we're on the verge of a literal fascist authoritarian takeover, not unlike the Nazis, you really think we're that close to the precipice. You should be real in favor of the Second Amendment right now. Like gun control would not be something that you would be really rattling the bars on. But I I digress. Um, For the record, you can think Trump is unfit for office or that he would be a bad president or that his policies are bad or that they would steer America in a dangerous direction. You can think a presidential candidate is a very bad presidential candidate. But if you think Trump would proclaim himself president for life and use SEAL Team 6 to whack opponents and jail the press and bring back bell-bottom jeans... The math here, if he is the American Hitler, is not one where you would wind up saying something like, I wish him a speedy recovery, and uh, we should all turn the political rhetoric down. You wouldn't you wouldn't say that about Hitler. So J.D.'s, excuse me, J.D. Vance's premise, we've not met, we're not on first terms. J.D. Vance's premise is that the assassination attempt on Trump is a direct result of oppositional rhetoric over the last eight years, asserting that Trump is a fascist existential threat and so forth, and that the heated apocalyptic rhetoric finally compelled some idiot 20-year-old to go buy a gun and try to whack him. And there's a straightforward logic to that. It makes sense. I see the logic. I 40% agree with that logic. But if we're going to accept that premise, gang, understand that it comes with a lot of other implications as well. 
Now, I've been working in political media since the tail end of the Obama years, and I worked in conservative media for a decent chunk of that. So let me tell you, we are not for want of apocalyptic, this guy will be the death of the republic dialogue from breathless conservative commentators, or notions that we are being literally invaded by Mexicans or that Democrats are trying to orchestrate a demographic replacement in order to ensure a permanent electoral advantage. In 2010, Newt Gingrich said that Democrats pose as great a threat to America as Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union once did, which would seem to me to be very much in the same kind of apocalyptic, hyperbolic ratcheting that we are now discussing. And I can think of at least one commentator, I hesitate to say I worked with him, but we worked on the same channel, and he repeatedly, loudly, and clearly said that Democrats hate America, they are literally a satanic party, and that they want America to fail so that they can rebuild a socialist nation on top of the ashes. Again, we're not for want of hyperbolic rhetoric in this country. And we don't have to go back very far to find some other deadly shootings in which the murderer was an extremist nut job who happened to listen to a lot of conservative rhetoric about Democrats being the death of America and the guy thinking that he was a patriot defending the country from an existential threat or uh, some race replacement theory that maybe the commentators weren't saying, but he believed that and was listening to the commentators at the same time. And to be clear, I'm going to be clear on this. I have no doubt that when some horrible person shoots up a church or a synagogue and they happen to be listening to conservative radio or they have Ben Shapiro in their tweets or whatever, I have no doubt that the conservative commentators, even the ones that are saying hyperbolic stuff, would honestly say, I utterly and categorically condemn political violence and racism, and this shooting was heinous. I have no doubt of that. I'm not trying to both sides this or engage in whataboutism. My point is not, yes, the Democrats have escalated things to an unsafe level, but wait also, though, you conservatives, you've done some bad things too. That's not what I'm saying. All I'm establishing is this. If we want to accept the premise that Democrats and never-Trumpers are responsible for this shooting by panicking a mentally unstable person, I assume, I'm assuming mentally unstable person, with hyperbolic rhetoric, or a mentally stable person just draws logical conclusions because he believes what everybody says. Either way, if we accept that premise, we do have to put blame on conservative pundits or politicians next time one of their crazies breaks into Nancy Pelosi's house and tries to brain her husband with a hammer, or shoots Gabby Giffords, or wanders into a pizza restaurant with a gun looking for pedophiles, or blows up a federal building in Oklahoma City. I think that we're in an era of what I call teeter-totter thinking, which I detest, in which for many people, the most irritating people, any political conversation is just a variation of which team is the bad team and which team is the good team. So any negative comment I make about blue team, that must, it must end up being a positive comment about red team. Or if I say something negative about Donald Trump, I must be saying something positive about Joe Biden. It's just putting pressure on a teeter-totter because everything is just a proxy war for who's the good team and who's the bad team. And so if you're thinking like that, I suppose you would view this conversation as Heaton trying to balance the teeter-totter, where the, well, the Democrats are at 40 and the Republicans are at 60 in terms of allocating political rhetoric or whatever. I'm not doing that. I'm not saying that both teams are equally bad or even trying to make an effort to adjudicate, okay, but the other team's truly the bad one. I'm, I'm not doing that. The answer to that, of course, is whichever team you don't like is the worst, right? Ask anyone in America whether their team is the unhinged team or not. Turns out everybody thinks the other team is unhinged team. So what I'm arguing for is consistency. If we want to go down the path where a political team is responsible for the violence perpetuated by its most deranged flunkies, then there's an awful lot of derangement to account for across the political spectrum, particularly in something as large as the conservative or progressive movements. When you get into Republican and Democratic parties, it, 
any group of people that large is going to have crazy violent people in it. You can't judge the party based on the the bottom 1% of it. So you can talk me into this position. As I said, I'm only about I'm I'm 40% with JD Vance on this. But I'm 60% no. So you could there's wiggle room here. You could maybe talk me into this, but I'm pretty emphatic that whatever position we arrive at, we need to be consistent about it. And I don't like this, but this is not going to be the end of political violence in America. Sadly, I doubt that this is the end of political violence in this election. So from where I'm at, I'm inclined to call people out who make apocalyptic and hyperbolic political rhetoric as either deranged or being hacks or being opportunists and hypocrites. There's no end of criticism on my end for hacky pundits who incidentally make much more money than me. My personal hack test, by the way, is this. This is how I assess if somebody's a hack or not. If their goal was to, irrespective of truth or analysis, demonize the other team and champion their own team and stir up their base for applause and profit, if that was their goal, what would they be doing differently than they're already doing? And if the answer is nothing, they're a political hack. And I hate them, and they probably make more money than me. But I'm hesitant to start laying culpability at the feet of loud partisans for when a nut job goes off. Because we've got a lot of nut jobs in this country, and we've got a fair amount of guns. So you may disagree with me on this one. That's fine. I'm not, I'm not 100% on this, but I do ask that we be consistent in application on this one. And I frankly don't think we want to open up that can of worms by saying that um, when somebody gets shot, it's it's on account of heightened political rhetoric because there is a lot of heightened political rhetoric. It's just that we tend to dismiss heightened political rhetoric from our team, whatever our team is, as being symbolic or uh, um, colorful, whereas we view it as uh, intentional and literal when the other team does it. And we think our team is mostly sane and the other team is crazy. So that's the framework we find ourselves in. And I'm, I'm hesitant to, to start really pointing fingers on that. If nothing else, I don't see it being a good way to lower the temperature. On that note, I think I very much agree with JD Vance on wanting to lower that temperature and, uh, I would hope everyone in the country wanting to lower that temperature. So let's observe the national temperature for a moment. I think it's kind of like summer in Austin, which is to say it's hot, but my God, it could be hotter. It's uncomfortably hot, but it could be so much hotter. It's been hotter in the past. We all know it could be. Had Donald Trump not turned his head at the exact right moment and that bullet had entered his skull, we would not be waking up in a shaken, sad country as we find ourselves in this week. We would be waking up in a dangerous country. Spoken up top in this episode about the segment of Democrats who believe that Trump is a Russian asset and that if he's elected, he will become a president for life. Uh, I, I had lunch, no, dinner at a uh, sushi restaurant here about a month or two ago, met some new people there, didn't know them. Uh, one of the guys was saying that uh, if the conservatives get into office, they they literally want to execute all of the transgender people and gays. That kind of, I don't think that's true, by the way, that kind of person. So there's that extreme segment within the Democratic Party that does not merely think Donald Trump is a very, very bad candidate, somebody that cannot be trusted with the nuclear codes, let alone the security of the nation, but that he is Hitlerian, that level. Let's flip it and consider the most fervent Trump supporters, the most vociferous Trump supporters within the Republican Party. There's a very large section of the GOP who believes that Trump won the 2020 election outright and that it was stolen from him by a corrupt establishment which fears him and will do anything to stop him. He rightfully won that election. He has not gone away, and since then he has been targeted by 
weaponized political prosecutions. He's been fined millions of dollars. And finally, he has been shot at. It's all but conclusive that between Biden's poor showing at the debate and a literal assassination attempt, replete with iconic photography, Trump's going to be a shoe in in November. But if he had died on Saturday, like I think the, the, the shooter gave the election to Trump, by the way. I think Trump is already going to win, but I think the shooter gave the election to Trump. But if he died on Saturday, there are millions of Republicans who would have believed that Democrats either arranged that assassination attempt consciously or that they at least drummed up the Hitlerian rhetoric until somebody murdered their standard bearer. And we would be living through a far more fraught, extremely tense situation. One with riots, possibly armed violence, probably a few red states prosecuting Joe Biden for inciting assassination. There's at least one Republican congressman that's calling for that. Potentially martial law in a couple of deep red states. Bulletproof bell-bottom jeans. I don't know. Fortunately, that didn't happen. We merely have an acrimonious election to live through, which I hope and pray doesn't get any worse or deadly than it already has. Not just because I'll be at the Republican and Democratic conventions, but uh, I'm pretty slippery. I don't think anybody's going to get me. But for other people, I'm, I'm worried. On Thursday, at that convention, Donald Trump is going to give his acceptance speech for the Republican nomination. And that is very likely going to be the most scrutinized acceptance speech in American history. It might be the most watched uh, political speech in American history. It wouldn't surprise me. And at that time, I see Trump going one of two ways. And I won't blame him if he says something to the effect of, the Democrats just tried to kill me. They've convinced half the country that I'm Hitler and somebody believed them and tried to kill me. They've tried to take me out with the courts and they finally tried to take me out with a gun. Democrats are tearing the country apart. They are willfully and hypocritically trying to get elected by peddling a myth that I am an evil dictator and somebody finally believed them and took a shot at me. And you have to vote for me to stop these people because they are evil and they will ruin this country. I won't blame Trump if he says something to that effect, swinging very, very hard at blue team and the media. I'm, I'm going to give a lot of latitude to anybody who just got shot in the ear in a near miss with death. I, I wouldn't blame anybody for being very, very angry and wanting to fight. That's one option. He comes out swinging and he does it in no doubt a much more Trumpian, hyperbolic way that's also a little bit ambiguous and uh, very inflamed. Before I get to what I hope he says, though, I'll say Trump has really only surprised me twice, like really surprised me. He always surprises me a little, but it's more of like, what's the variable going to be rather than is there going to be a variable like he'll he'll be giving some speech and he'll go if elected i will personally strangle the head of a mexican drug cartel in the white house rose garden and like that surprised me i didn't know he was going to say that but i knew he was going to say something like he was going to say that or he was going to say that he was going to put barney the dinosaur in jail for pedophilia or uh he you know, thinks the president of Belgium's wife is ugly, something like that. But you know he's going to say something, right? But the only two times he's ever truly surprised me where I just got real quiet happened in 2016. In 2016, he radically departed from that standard, over-the-top, everything-is-best-or-worse cartoon character when he lost the Iowa caucus to Ted Cruz. Now, I was working in political media at that time. So I'm following all of this on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, incidentally, I saw what Trump was doing. I mean, I, I could look at the numbers. Whenever he dropped in the polls during the Republican primaries, he would just say something batshit crazy the following day. Like he would just come out and, and say like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident that Hillary Clinton's an android or something. And we would all go, what? And we would all pay attention to it. And it was a very shrewd, calculating strategy that I think he is intuitively genius at, which is say crazy stuff for media attention, suck all the oxygen out of the room. So I'm watching this in real time. I'm watching every time he drops two points, he says something nuts, goes back up again, and I become kind of used to this. In the Iowa caucus, 
he loses to Ted Cruz. And so I'm expecting him to come out and accuse Ted Cruz of the JFK assassination or something like that. But he comes out and he was very calm. He was very gracious. And he said, just very simply, I want to congratulate Ted Cruz. His team worked very hard on this victory. They should be very proud of their victory tonight. They worked very hard. They did a good job. They should be celebrating. And then he went on to discuss you know, whatever he was doing next in the campaign. And that there was a part of my brain that went, wait a minute, is the is the like accusing Rosie O'Donnell of murder kind of stuff just schlock? Is it just, was that real Trump? Did we just see real Trump? Like, is the other thing just a gimmick? I don't know. And then on election night in 2016, which by the way, there's footage of me with my hand on my head, my hands on my forehead. Like I've just been sitting there jaw agape for 20 minutes straight uh, inside the News Corp building. And I was further rattled by the fact that Outside, I could hear a crowd chanting, lock her up, which is not what I want to hear in a democracy. I don't want to hear people saying, let's prosecute the other team. And as that's happening, into that shock, Trump comes out and gave an extremely calm, gracious, unifying speech, one that surprised me and one that mollified me to a great extent from my own panic that was going on. He came out and he said, I've just received a call from Secretary Clinton. She congratulated us on our victory, and I congratulate her and her family on a very, very hard-fought campaign. Hillary has worked very long and very hard over a long period of time, and we owe her a major debt of gratitude for her service to our country. I mean that very sincerely. Now it is time for America to bind the wounds of division to all Republicans and Democrats and independents across the nation, I say it is time for us to come together as one united people. It's time. I pledge to every citizen of our land that I will be president for all Americans and that this is so important to me. It wasn't what I expected. Not from a guy that was basically threatening to lock up his political opposition as one of his catchy campaign slogans. I was taken aback by that. I was taken aback by the fact that it was gracious and it was conciliatory and i thought maybe this bombastic offensive character who did in fact accuse ted cruz's dad of murdering jfk and did a lot of really nasty stuff during the campaign not to mention kind of scary stuff maybe that was just campaigning like maybe maybe he's just gonna like take that costume off and govern as a fairly calm dude and everybody will go back to normal and it didn't go that way the Trump years were pretty acrimonious and chaotic, in my view. Uh, side note, not a lot of fun to be an independent during the Trump years. Uh, not a lot of fun. Uh, uh, my um, New York friends were a lot less uh, patient with anybody not being whatever they were. So not not fun for an independent, but... I don't know. There was a, a moment where I thought maybe maybe the, the whole thing was going to calm down. And I'm hoping that that is the Trump we see this week. We see a leader come out and address a very rattled, very angry, somewhat terrified nation. And in that moment, he appeals to our better angels and points the country towards grace and and unity, rather than doing the alternate, which he can do, which is harnessing those negative emotions as a propulsive element for his own ambitions. And I hope he comes out, I hope he says something like that victory speech he gave, where he says, I am not running as a Republican to defeat the Democrats. I am running to be president of all Americans, Republicans, independents, and Democrats. And I am going to do an amazing job, even for the people that disagree with me. And I welcome disagreement and I welcome pushback. I want you to keep me honest and I want you to test my ideas. But I want America to do that within a frame of decency and rationalism we can all agree on. We'll see. We'll see. 
I'm rooting for the better angel speech. Particularly given that I think Trump pretty much has this thing in the bag, by the way. Just as a quick as a quick side note, I will be uh, spending a lot of time with Justin Robert Young over the next few days, not to mention a live show that I'll plug here in a moment. Uh, Justin, I think, very presciently pointed out on his own program that Joe Biden ran to a great extent on Donald Trump as an existential threat. And you were electing me to defeat this threat to the country. If Biden didn't already have an uphill battle, he now has to drop that whole strategy because he can't really say Trump is an existential threat and then say we really need to turn down the political rhetoric. We need to turn down the temperature. Like it just it doesn't work. He's the the tool he was most using is now gone on top of all of the other problems he had. So I think Trump's probably got it in the bag. And I think the speech we're about to hear is effectively the first speech of the 47th president. And uh, whoever our president's going to be next term, I am rooting for them. And I am rooting for them to be a unifying force in our country, in a very divided country, rather than a catalyst in its demise. So Donald Trump had a very near miss over the weekend, but I think America did too. And as a result of that very, very close call, we came to a horrible situation that would not end well. I think a lot of Democrats are having to rethink the outright Hitler comparisons that they've played around with. Not all of them, some of them. There's a lot of people that are going, okay, I need to be a little bit more careful with my words. That what I mean is a very, 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 very bad direction that we're going down, not Nazi Germany. And at the same time, I think a lot of Republicans are thinking about, in a broad sense, the consequence of hyperbolic rhetoric. And we have mercifully been given a timeout to reassess how we're reacting to all of this. I hope that Donald Trump and the American people as a whole will appeal to the good side of American character more than the ass-kicking proclivities we occasionally have to rely on. And I'll end on this note. Um, There's not a lot you and I can do about what Trump or Biden are going to say. We get to vote, but not sure what state you're in. I don't think my vote has much impact. I'm I'm in a large red state. Unless you're one of like five states, there's really only about 50,000 people truly whose vote is going to make a difference this election. I don't know what, 70,000 maybe. There's not a lot we can do. The zone of control that we have is how we react to presidential candidates, but I would say more importantly to how we react to our friends and neighbors in a very acrimonious cycle. And I think it's very, very important to remember that good and intelligent people can disagree on matters of substance. That if you are a Biden supporter who is terrified of Donald Trump, it is not because you hate half the country or you hate the country, that you have reasons, whether they're good or bad, that have driven you to this position, and that for Trump supporters, the vast majority of them are not going to go vote for Donald Trump because they hate black people or they hate Mexicans or they want to institute a theocracy. Actually, the, the vast majority of Americans broadly agree on the same good stuff. And most of the fights we have are not diametrically opposed viewpoints. They are prioritizing values that we all agree on. That's most people. I would say 80% of the people in this country agree that individual liberty and collective security are both important. And we are constantly modulating which of those two is more important. We're constantly trying to figure out the ideal constellation of stars that we all agree on. 
And so when our neighbors start putting up signs for Trump or Biden or RFK Jr. or Chase Oliver or whoever, I think it's very important to remember that at the end of this election, they're still going to be our neighbors. This is not going to be a purge. Whichever side wins doesn't get to kick out the half of the country that voted against them. We still got to figure out how to get along with each other. And the really good news, the really good news is most of the people in the country are decent, good people. The vast majority. Most of the people in the country that are voting for Trump are much more like the father and firefighter chief, former firefighter chief that got shot this week than the man that pulled the trigger. Most of the people that are voting for Biden are good people. The fundamentals of the country are good. The fundamental nature of the people in the country are good. And it's up to us to lower the temperature in our own lives, which I think does have a cumulative effect on the rest of the country. All right. Uh, Before I sign off for today, um, as I said, I'm going to be in Milwaukee. I will be doing a live show with Justin Robert Young and Jen Briney on my other program, We're Not Wrong, where I play much more of a pundit than I do here. Here I'm an idea butler for you. And today I'm like, I don't know, Mr. Rogers or something. But anyway, I play a pundit on We're Not Wrong. We're going to do a live show that I think will be very interesting. This Friday at 7 o'clock at the Skylight Musical Theater in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And we will be hanging out at a bar afterwards, and we want to meet you, and we want to hang out. We've done this multiple times. I love doing meetups. It's great to meet people. Um, There's a lot of listeners who are always, like, slightly worried that they're going to bug me. I am doing the meetup explicitly because I want you to fill the gaping hole in my heart that is my low self-esteem. So absolutely come out, say hi. You need to go to Skylight Musical Theater's webpage to buy tickets for that. And uh, yeah, come check that out. Come enjoy that. I will probably be doing more episodes this week as well. One would assume that we'll touch base on whoever the beep is, if not more commentary on the Republican convention. But uh, uh, yeah, stay classy, everybody. Okay, until next time, I've been Andrew Heaton, and so have you.